Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us again for another crypto journey. It's been a tumultuous couple of weeks in the market, a lot has happened. So we've got Stephen McCaskill, our CEO of Dasset, to talk us through that. Like always, we welcome questions and, react uh, and interactions throughout. Thank you, Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you everyone for joining. Today we are talking about uh, the market. What is happening? What the heck is happening in the markets? And uh, here's a great chart that kind of shows you what's been happening with the Bitcoin price. As you can see, the Bitcoin price is at a low for the year. So uh, we, we continue to test new lows for Bitcoin. And there's been a sharp and sudden uh, drop in price over the last few weeks. Uh, why is that? Why has uh, the price dropped? This is a question that has a lot of people wondering and asking questions. Right now, the uh, fear and greed index, it's not the lowest it's ever been, but it's pretty darn low. Uh, there's extreme fear in the marketplace, and it's uh, primarily due to uh, a few big reasons, which we'll talk about towards the end of this presentation. But uh, looking at the overall market, I think what we can uh, infer from what is happening is a uh, overall change in the global macro economy. So this isn't really a Bitcoin problem. This is more a civilization problem where over the last 10 years, there are a number of um, things that have materialized that have put us in the position that we're in currently. Uh, and that really started around 2009, 2010, when we had the uh, great financial uh, recession um, in, in 2008. So really, as a response to um, the economic downturn over a decade ago, what we started seeing was uh, things called quantitative easing and money printing. So um, a lot of the problems that we have with the monetary system really started uh, over 10 years ago where some of these new economic policies started coming out where it was really a race to the bottom. And central banks started using uh, new ways to play with the economy. Uh, particularly, they, they were using all this excess money that they were printing to buy stocks in the market, to buy debt in the market. And so um, some companies have, uh, um, ownership by central banks uh, around the world because the, the central banks have, have been buying equities, have been buying uh, all kinds of different assets. So in New Zealand, uh, I believe the, the central bank here was um, buying debt, for example, Auckland City Council debt and uh, 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 things like debt that relate to mortgages. So, so different central banks and different jurisdictions have been buying assets and really creating uh, a lot of um, bubbles in a variety of different markets. So uh, when we saw, see that Bitcoin went to $69,000 last year, that was really a, um, a way for all this excess money that's been printed in the market to go somewhere. So it wasn't just Bitcoin. It was real estate, it was art, stocks, and um, so this is where we've seen these huge bubbles. And so, um, the, and, and that was really exacerbated because of the response to the lockdowns, where we've been money printing, printing a lot of money over the last decade, but that was accelerated um, uh, drastically in 2021 and uh, 2020. And so um, all this money printing has uh, overpriced assets, which include Bitcoin. It's, it's really distorted the economy and market as a whole. And so 
um, we're, we're kind of in an environment where it's not really Bitcoin that's the problem, it's the overall economy. And a lot of people think that there may be relief over the next few months, but uh, when we look at the overall economy, uh, it's, it's quite apparent that things are going to get worse before they get better. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, mortgage rates are 5 6%, and interest rates are continuing to rise. Uh, about 20 years ago, mortgage rates in New Zealand were uh, 12 to 20%. So it's not impossible for mortgage rates to get to 8, 10, 12, 14% over the next uh, 18, 24 months. And what does that really mean? Um, really, that is going to impact people, individuals, uh, households. And so we haven't really had that impact on personal um, households from the economic policies. You know, it takes a good uh, 12, 18 months for the consequences of increasing interest rates to really be felt. When we look at the legacy markets, uh, we, we haven't really been hit that hard on a personal level. And so if we see more uh, down in the economy, then it's likely there will be more down in Bitcoin. Uh, part of the reason why is Bitcoin is considered a high-risk asset. And so because it's high-risk asset, it's something that people will look at selling first before they sell anything else. And this is what we've started to see on the institutional side. Uh, about uh, 70, 80 percent of all Bitcoin transactions since mid 2020 have been institutions uh, getting exposure into Bitcoin. Now, institutions are uh, risk averse. They're worried about the overall economy. And so um, they're selling their high risk assets first. And those high risk assets are Bitcoin and stocks. So uh, that's kind of what we're seeing um, uh, as, as Bitcoin's more like a canary in the coal, in the coal mine, where it's uh, warning us before um, uh, the, the impact that's, that's happening in the rest of the world. Um, bear case, not necessarily for right now, but in the near term future, um, issues around regulations. And it's a tricky one because regulations can help the industry go in, in both directions. And there's been a lot of controversy over the last few weeks around crypto and regulation, and has really sparked uh, part of this most recent downturn. And so, um, you know, I think regulation is a bit of a, a tricky one where there will be some that come out that impact the market negatively, and there will be some that come out that impact the market positively. And uh, a, a good example is um, in Europe, they're considering banning privacy coins. So uh, privacy coins may not do well in the near future if they're harder to get on ramps, off ramps. They're considered illegal in certain countries, potentially. Uh, also, there's been some controversy around things like regulating uh, DeFi or decentralized finance. I think that can create a knee jerk negative reactions to the market, but overall, it's it's very will be very difficult to regulate DeFi as a whole. And so uh, then we come to things like better regulations of centralized entities. Well, that could be very um, bullish in, in terms of the industry having a, a lot more certainty and enabling entities like banks to work in the industry a little bit better. So there are some positives in regulation that, that can help the market, but then there's some things that are a bit iffy. The transition of Ethereum to proof of stake creates some concerns around regulating proof of stake assets like Ethereum as a security. And I think this is a really bad direction that regulators are going in, uh, or specifically the Securities Exchange Commission out of the US. 
And hopefully the recent scrutiny that's, that's uh, happening in the market will prevent that from happening because uh, there'll be a lot of negative consequences of proof of stake networks are classified as securities. And uh, so, so that could be very problematic for the industry short term. But uh, I think those things will, will work themselves out over a little bit of time. Uh, the dollar, the dollar has been very strong. So uh, last crypto journey, Aditya spoke and, and gave a talk about um, the milkshake theory and uh, went a little bit into why the FX um, and, and the dollar in particular is um, really strong. And because of those reasons that, that he went over, um, it's, it's really setting other assets back, such as Bitcoin, but not just Bitcoin, even the New Zealand dollar. So New Zealand dollar is very weak right now compared to the US dollar. Uh, another bear case is the, there, there's still a lot of projects that are hanging on that really need to be cleared out. And so, so we're seeing a lot of crypto projects that don't, um, that, sh sh that, 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 really need to reallocate their capital towards projects that are actually creating value. And so, um, you know, 90% of the crypto projects from 2017 never came back and um, most of them failed or in the long process of failing. I think we're going to see the same for the projects that came out uh, between 2020 and 2022. And that's what we're seeing right now. Basically, these projects are getting ready to fail, never come back. And that's a healthy uh, evolution in the market. So, um, so there's a lot of reasons why we're still bearish, uh, why market could um, have further uh, downturn. Uh, is Bitcoin correlated to the stock market? I don't think so. Uh, the Bitcoin price moves along with the stock market. So um, we've seen the stock market having a correction down. Bitcoin is having a correction down. They are going um, in the same direction because they're both considered high risk assets. People are selling them for the same reason. I would make the case that Bitcoin is more correlated to the money supply and the um, Bitcoin index than it is to the stock market. And because the strength of the dollar, um, because uh, we're seeing um, a lot more demand for dollars, uh, it is causing the uh, S&P to correct, it's causing things like Bitcoin to correct and um, institutions looking for those uh, less risky assets. And so, um, although they're moving in tandem, it doesn't mean that they're correlated to each other. And there are other in, uh, factors that are, I think, have, have a bigger impact on Bitcoin than, um, say, the S&P. So uh, how low can Bitcoin go? Uh, believe it or not, Bitcoin can go down to $3,000. And uh, these are US dollars, I should say. Um, will it? go to $3,000? Probably not. Uh, very, very unlikely, but you know, it is something that you should be aware of as a possibility. $6,000, again, uh, it's possible, it's unlikely, but it is a value that Bitcoin can drop to. So uh, this is where, you, you know, if you think that the market is, um, you know, we're going to have a bull market in the next week or next month. Uh, I would uh, hold off on that thought and really uh, analyze the market over a long period of time and um, realize that this is really a marathon. It's, it's not a race. And um, it's going to take some time for the market to flesh out. Uh, 14,000. I think 14,000 is a likely number. Uh, this is something that's possible um, in the next few weeks. Uh, not saying that we're going to drop to 14,000, just saying that this is a potential uh, bottom for Bitcoin in, in the near term future. 
And so these are kind of numbers to keep an eye out for because, um, you know, uh, where would you want to buy? Where would you want to get into market? If you think that Bitcoin and crypto assets are creating a new digital economy and um, is, is the future, um, look at price points that make sense to start entering the market over the next 18 months. Uh, possible bear scenarios. Um, the one is capitulation soon. So uh, we hit a bottom in the next few days, in the next few weeks, uh, with a retest of those lows sometime early next year. So that's a uh, very likely scenario. Uh, second scenario, I'd say, is uh, just going sideways. You know, we can bounce around from $16,000 per Bitcoin to $25,000 and uh, just bounce around for the next year. And so those, you know, anything can happen. Bitcoin can all of a sudden start recovering. But I think these are the two uh, most likely scenarios where we aren't expecting a bull market for at least another year. Um, again, that can change. But uh, this is what we're expecting and uh, expecting for quite some time. So um, if you're looking at entering the market, you know, again, it's, it's a marathon. Uh, look at it over a long period of time. Uh, there's no rush to be getting into the market um, today or tomorrow. And, um, you know, there's, there's definitely some scenarios that can play out in terms of creating potential new lows. Now we get to the exciting stuff. Uh, people have been going through the rumor mill. So everyone from uh, JP Morgan, the head, the head of JP Morgan, to uh, Elon Musk, to uh, the White House, to uh, every major news outlet talking about this collapse of FTX and the crazy couple weeks that have impacted the market. Did FTX cause the price to go down? Is the FTX the reason why the Bitcoin price is what it is today? And I would argue no. Uh, the reason why um, you know FTX is a catalyst, but it's not the cause and the reason why uh, prices are going to new lows. In fact, if FTX wasn't an issue, it's still likely um, Bitcoin and, and ETH would be at the prices that they're currently at. And so, um, uh, so, so it's, it's fun to look into uh, FTX and, and what's happening, but it's important to realize that they're not the main reason why um, we're, we're hitting new market lows uh, in, in the market. But uh, let's let's dive in. You know, they, they are one entity that uh, is causing a lot of fear and um, concern in the industry. Really, we don't have the facts yet. So this is theories uh, based online. And so um, you do have to take this with a grain of salt because this is what I've seen as a pretty good um, explanation of, of what's happening and what's happened. But we're still working it out. And essentially, a very large crypto, centralized crypto exchange called FTX uh, went bust over the last two weeks. And the exchange uh, really derived from a company called Alameda Research in 2017. And what they were doing was arbitrage between uh, regulatory arbitrage between different jurisdictions. So you notice that the Bitcoin price was different in the United States, uh, Korea, and Japan, and they do arbitrage between those different jurisdictions to make um, money. The difference between that arbitrage, um, yeah, between the arbitrage. Over time, the uh, number of entities doing this um, really cut their profit margins. They weren't really making money from this arbitrage uh, after their um, initial profitability in 2017. So uh, with profitability down, what they did was launch an exchange. So relatively new market entrant, 
and they launched the exchange FTX. This is where we start seeing a moral hazard and conflicts of interest because now you have two companies. One company is an exchange, FTX, and the other is Alameda Research, which is a trading company and a market maker. This is where we uh, we know some of the activity that they've done, and we we know that um, it's you know what they've done wasn't great, uh, was was really unethical. So so there are some things that we can point to and, and know uh, without a doubt that this is what they did. So essentially, Alameda had the data of their traders on FTX, and so um, Alameda had the ability to trade against the, uh, the customers of FTX and um, essentially liquidate them and go for um, mass liquidations of their customers so that they could profit off those liquidations. And so that's, that's a, a um, conflict of interest and a problem of having a market maker that has owns an exchange and has all the data of the exchange. And so that's the unethical. Um, I don't, I, I think people, it, it'd be shocking to me if people didn't realize this before FTX collapsed. Uh, it's pretty evident that this is something that they were doing. And, um, you, you know, it's just kind of out there. And uh, so I don't think anyone um, wasn't expecting that they were doing this. But the crazy thing is they should have been making money doing that. And so, um, this exchange is missing $10 billion. Nobody really knows where it went. And that's $10 billion in customer funds. And so there are a couple of theories around where that money went, but the guess is um, as a market maker, Alameda was setting prices that were uh, a little bit too good in that they were losing money on every trade. So this was a way for them to attract customers, to attract traders and get their volume um, increased. And so a lot of institutions, a lot of traders came onto FTX and took the other side of the trade. And they were the ones making all the money. And so even though Alameda had all the data, had all the um, right pieces to make a lot of money, make a lot of money off their customers, they uh, were clearly making pretty bad decisions and ended up spending a lot more money than what they had. And this resulted in uh, getting, um, you know, having a deficit. Uh, didn't really help when some other entities collapsed, when Celsius, Terra Luna, um, Three Arrows Capital uh, collapsed earlier in the year. My understanding is Alameda had uh, some losses there. And to cover those losses, rather than let Alameda fold, FTX lent customer funds to Alameda. Um, the other aspect is uh, Alameda and FTX had a lot of tokens, uh, but the tokens were either locked or had valuations on paper that when looking at the reality of those valuations did not fly. And so, the um, yeah, so so basically, uh, what happened was FTX had some uh, had a blog about regulation, and they pushed for regulating decentralized finance as a way to um, push regulation in the United States. And this, I think, really sparked um, the the main issue, where uh, people started really not liking what um, the CEO of FTX was talking about with crypto regulation. And so a debate on the 29th of October happened between the CEO of FTX and the CEO of Shapeshift. And it was around crypto regulation. The debate was, uh, should regulators regulate decentralized finance um, or, decent or uh, regulate crypto? And uh, SBF was really pushing for a um, for for regulation of 
gatekeepers, such as websites that interacted with decentralized finance. A lot of people didn't like that. And this is where I think the trouble started because it was really backlash from the crypto community towards the um, towards Alameda's uh, or FTX's view on regulations and uh, how it uh, works with the crypto ethos. And um, the idea was that, or, or that the, the community was pushing was that FTX was lobbying to regulate uh, DeFi while um, having lighter regulations on his own. And so this was the perception of the market. And so as a response, somebody managed to get their hands on the balance sheet of, F uh, of Alameda and release it. What the balance sheet showed was that the majority, um, so they had about $14 billion in assets. The majority of those assets were illiquid and a lot of them were their own exchange token. And so uh, Binance, as a response to that, started selling uh, their holdings of FTX's digital token. And what this did was push the price of the token down from a, a value of $22 and just started tanking. And the problem was that Alameda had a lot of loans against the FTT token. And so they started getting a uh, margin call. Uh, when the FTT token started dropping. And this is um, really part of uh, one, one half the issue. The second half is people started uh, getting very worried and started pulling their assets off um, FTX. And so within a day, uh, about $6 billion in crypto assets were withdrawn and FTX ran out of all their liquid assets and could no longer uh, fulfill customer withdrawals. And so um, they went to Binance for help. Binance looked at their books and realized that they were uh, in the hole for $10 billion and refused to bail them out. And that is where the market started panicking. We're, we're kind of in this phase right now. We have contagion in the market. We don't really know uh, which companies have exposure to FTX and which ones don't. And so this is where we've seen uh, the largest withdrawal of, of crypto assets from exchanges in history and um, a, lot of, a lot of fear. I'm really fortunate to say that Dasset had zero um, exposure to FTX. Uh, we never really worked with FTX uh, directly. Um, the only exposure that we have as a company would be to Bittrex. And we did look and in, into Bittrex's exposure to FTX. Uh, Bittrex actually does have a little bit of exposure to FTX, but it was uh, the tokenized securities. So there are tokens that represented things like Apple shares, um, Twitter shares, that kind of stuff. And so they were offering that product through Alameda Research. However, uh, Bittrex, um, Bittrex's losses there are negligible and they actually uh, are paying everyone out of pocket. So it doesn't really matter what happens with FTX and Alameda. Uh, Bittrex has already covered um, the losses, which I think were only in, in a few uh, million dollars. So in terms of Bittrex's exposure to FTX, it was very minimal and um, it didn't cause any problems on a mass scale. And so, um, you know, I'm fortunate to say that, that we're okay, um, but I do know many people personally that have been impacted by this and do know of other institutions that have been heavily impacted. And so we're still uh, waiting on news over the next couple of weeks as to um, what's, uh, what the full impact is going to be in terms of the, uh, which companies in the industry are going to be impacted negatively. And um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so, so we're still, still kind of um, working it out. The other thing is we still don't know the full truth. So th this is really a theory of where the losses have gone. Uh, we've seen that FTX spent um, 
tens of millions of dollars on um, donations to politicians. They spent tens of millions of dollars on things like uh, stadiums and marketing. Um, the, the money could have gone in, in many different directions. And so um, it's, it's not going to be for another, um, you know, three, four years until we probably figure out all, all the details. Um, I think that the, the one sad thing about what's, what's happened with FTX is that they filed for bankruptcy. And I say that's sad because it's going to get out of it. Um, if you know about Mt. Gox in 2013, you'll know that it's been nine years and people have yet to get paid out from the collapse of Mt. Gox nine years ago. So with FTX filing for bankruptcy, it's likely going to be 9, 10, 11, 12 years before customers of FTX that have losses will be able to recover anything. So not the most ideal. Lots of things happening in the market from a negative perspective. Let's look at what's um, what some of the positive or potential bullish um, uh, things that are coming to Bitcoin and, and crypto. So the dollar, um, the US dollar index is uh, not as strong as what it was a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago. And so uh, that is creating a little bit of relief for markets. And so uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have uh, a bull market, but it certainly puts um, a lot of ease on assets like gold, on the stock market, on Bitcoin. The other interesting thing, looking at gold, looking at Bitcoin as a hedge against systemic risk, if we start seeing bank failures on a much larger scale, uh, we could see the narrative that something like Bitcoin, where you have complete possession of the Bitcoin, it's not held on um, you know, an entity like FTX, that uh, it's a better solution than holding dollars in the bank. Uh, and, a, and it's not as much of an issue in a place like New Zealand, where uh, the banking system is a little bit better than the rest of the world, but Europe is uh, banking system is not doing well. And that is a concern because there is, you, you know, what we're kind of seeing with FTX is really peanuts compared to what we could see as contagion in the legacy financial market. And so if, if there's <laughs> contagion in the legacy financial market, um, where people are, don't know which banks are solvent and which ones are not, then uh, it could drive a lot more demand for assets that people have full custody over, such as Bitcoin. So there is potential for uh, a bullish case for Bitcoin in the event of uh, all this um, financial collapse around us. Uh, inflation, inflation is not over. Uh, it has dropped a little bit uh, this month, but really we have yet to see whether um, w w whether that's going to die down. So if we continue to have pretty strong inflation into next year, then uh, assets such as Bitcoin uh, could do well because there's a lot of money on the sidelines and there's, there's no reason why it couldn't go into something like Bitcoin. Despite looking at a bear and bull case for uh, Bitcoin, I don't think it makes sense to really be uh, very optimistic about the price of Bitcoin, the price of crypto assets over the next uh, month, three months, six months, maybe even a year. And so really now is the opportunity to look at the industry. If, if you um, are interested in providing a new product or service, now is the time to get in. Now is the time to get involved, to participate, look at what projects are out there and start building for the next wave of adoption. The amount of development that's needed is huge. That means that the opportunities 
there are massive. And really, because uh, a big reason why is, is this next phase of adoption is where we're going to have one to two billion people start using crypto assets, start using blockchain technology. And so um, acquiring a billion users requires a lot of innovation, a lot of development. And that is what we are focusing on over the next year and a half. Um, this is what the industry is really good at. This is where uh, industry comes to shine because we can get rid of the fluff. We can get rid of the projects that are promising a lot, but they don't really have um, a lot of legs to stand on. You know, it's a project that's come before its time. Um, it's a project where the team members are just trying to get rich quick. Um, we can get rid of all of that. And that's what's happening now. We're, we're getting rid of the projects that um, are uh, really need to go so that we can focus on building the next phase of adoption for crypto. So now it's really the opportunity to look at entering the market from a um, business perspective because uh, there are a lot of problems that need to be solved and there's a lot of opportunity solving those problems to bring crypto to the global economy. And so um, really that's what the next year is about, building infrastructure, improving uh, the network, improving the user experience so that we can get um, uh, the next billion users. So um, metaverse, metaverse probably not gonna come next year. Uh, that infrastructure is being built, but it's gonna take a while. Um, infrastructure is really important. If you think about MetaMask, it's kind of like MySpace. It's crap. It needs a lot of work and that creates a lot of opportunity. That user friendliness still uh, is missing. The um, problems with transaction fees and scalability, those are problems that are being solved now. And that is, um, really where, uh, if you're interested in getting in the market, um, you should be looking at. There's still some things in, say, decentralized finance that are missing or pretty uh, early days. For example, insurance uh, products are, are pretty early. So there's lots of markets in the crypto space that are um, areas that uh, really um, need a lot more robustness, a lot more development. And so I'm, I'm hoping that some people here look at crypto, look at the industry to uh, as a, um, a way to start creating new opportunities, create new value for people, because now is the time, the next 18 months is the time to start jumping into crypto and start working in this industry to help build uh, the future digital uh, economy. So um, lots of things being developed in the groundwork. Um, and that is, uh, that's the most important aspect of what's, what's gonna happen over the next 18 months. So price isn't really gonna matter. Uh, it's really um, creating value, creating business models that work for a lot of people. That's what is the exciting thing over the next 18 months. And so if you are here because you think the price is gonna go up, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Better to think about the projects that create value. How do they create value? How can you interact with them? You know, how can you participate? And uh, by helping other people uh, with these projects, uh, you can earn tokens. Um, and, you know, maybe those tokens will have more value down the road. But really, at the end of the day, it's about creating a transparent, uh, and sound financial system. And so, um, so I'll leave it there for questions because uh, I, I know there might be a lot of questions, particularly around uh, FTX. Uh, you know, I, I guess I will give an opinion, and this is an opinion. Uh, and and that's partly why we never really worked with FTX. I, I mean, so, so fairly new market participant, uh, in, in crypto space, so um, they haven't, haven't been around for a long time. And the mentality of, of um, FTX was, was something 
for me, didn't really fit the crypto ethos, partly why we, we hadn't worked with them in the past, but it did take me by surprise realizing that they um, were unable to process customers' deposits and withdrawals and having a whole of $10 billion uh, really shocked me. And diving into it, I don't think it's as bad as, as people um, take it to be in that they have a lot of illiquid assets. And I think, you know, if you look at FTX and um, view them as a bank, or if they were a bank, then they probably wouldn't be in the position that they were in because they'd be able to use a central bank or a clearinghouse to uh, cover their illiquid assets. Uh, you know, if you think about a bank, 90% um, of the bank's assets are illiquid, their properties, uh, their loans, their mortgages, that kind of thing. And so um, they're able to uh, tap into the bank network to get um, overnight loans from the central bank or from another bank uh, for the most part, most of the time. Whereas FTX didn't really have that support, but at the same time, uh, they were doing something bad. We have some questions, Stephen. Customer funds. Yep. Uh, so we have three Sorry questions. Enough. First off, our first one. Can you please reiterate how Alameda were potentially trading against exchange users? Mm, great question. Okay, so um, in the legacy markets, there's a concept called front running. And uh, in some countries, it's considered illegal. And so front running is where a uh, company, say the New York Stock Exchange has um, servers and an order book, and they're able to place, um, uh, they're, they're able to get all their customer orders and see those orders before they get submitted to the order book. And so what, um, what they'll do is play, they get their customer orders and they'll place orders right in front of their customers to, so if they see all their customers are selling, then they'll put in sell orders before their customers to um, sell, be, yeah, sell before their customers. And so, um, so yeah, so, so front running is an issue and it's moral hazard uh, in the legacy markets. And so, what FTX is, what it stands for is a, a futures exchange. So what they primarily had were um, leveraged trading. So they had a lot of leveraged trading, uh, perpetual contracts, and they were able to see where customers were placing orders and what type of collateral those customers had and where their liquidations were. And so a customer would use their platform and create a leveraged trade where it had a certain price uh, that um, would margin call or liquidate that customer. Well, FTX had all that data and gave all that data to Alameda Research. And so what Alameda Research would do is look at the levels where their customers would get liquidated and they'd move the price of Bitcoin or ETH to liquidate uh, their customers. And this would essentially force their customers to lose their money. And uh, so this is where you start seeing um, short squeezes or uh, very quick moves in the price of Bitcoin or ETH because uh, market makers are trying to find the people who are over leveraged and uh, wipe them out. And so Alameda Research had the data. They had exactly, um, they knew exactly where their customers' positions were and they um, would target their positions particularly to liquidate them. And so that's why, you know, if you were trading on, um, that's why they call it gambling because at the end of the day you're putting money in for them to specifically wipe you out and so that's the weird thing the they had the data to make money they should have been raking in money from 
these practices, which are unethical. And uh, they weren't, um, or potentially because they were losing money elsewhere. But this is a conflict of interest between being an exchange and a market maker. And so for Dasset, you know, we don't market make on our own uh, markets. We use third parties to market make uh, that are unrelated to our company. We don't share any insider data. Um, you know, any information you can get on Dasset uh, is publicly accessible by our API. So really, um, if you have access to our API, you can um, get the same data as any institution on our platform. Uh, okay, John would like to know, um, he still doesn't quite understand the correlation between coin price and infrastructure projects. Let's go here. So what's in store for 2023? Talking about infrastructure investment. So I wouldn't say that there is a direct correlation between um, the price of a crypto asset and infrastructure, but at least not an immediate or direct price impact. However, infrastructure enables adoption. And so investment in infrastructure that can bring on a billion users into the crypto space um, is, is uh, long-term positive for the price of those assets. For example, if a billion people were able to easily um, get on board and, and own Bitcoin in a few minutes uh, without having to um, go through, you know, some some processes like you know writing down your seed and uh, doing things like that, then uh, there'd be a lot more demand and interest in, in use of Bitcoin, for example. And so, infrastructure is um, the middleware. It's where um, it's. it's uh, it's kind of boring, um, but at the same time, it's critical. It's absolutely critical. And there are some infrastructure gaps in our industry and, that need to be solved. And so that's where I see, you know, Dasset has a piece of infrastructure in New Zealand. And um, we're looking at how we can improve this infrastructure. Um, and, and so there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes or like, for example, the way that data comes to your wallet, like MetaMask, you know, they use these uh, different um, apps or, or nodes called RPCs. There are these connections that um, connect you to the blockchain. Um, there's different wallets that connect with these RPCs and have, provide different services. And so um, that's also pieces of infrastructure. We haven't really nailed the best um, onboarding infrastructure in the industry yet. Uh, you know, there's still user experience that, that needs to come. And so that is where there, there's a lot of development happening over the next year, and that will help bring the next billion users. So um, it's not a direct correlation by any means, but it is uh, helps with that long-term um, anti-fragile growth of the industry. And next question, it's good to know that Dasset does not work with FTX. Who, do, who does Dasset, Dasset work with? Great question. Yeah, so uh, we probably work with Bittrex. We are um, pretty happy with them. They are one of the oldest exchanges in the world. So they've been around since 2014. Their cold wallet um, is insured. It's one of the few entities that have insurance around um, their crypto assets. They, uh, a lot of the engineers came from uh, entities like Microsoft and AWS. So uh, they have a, a very security first mindset and they've been battle tested. Uh, they've been through uh, many bear and, and bull markets. They, their infrastructure has been battle tested. They're, um, you know, they've, they've recently gone through um, a, a huge process with regulators, which they're pretty happy about. Um, you know, they're currently going through uh, bit licensing in New York State, uh, which is a pretty big deal since there are only a few entities that have licensing there. 
And um, yeah, I mean, they, they are really uh, here to support the crypto ethos. And that's, that's something else, you know, FTX was uh, kind of got this vibe that it was uh, about the money, it was about getting rich as opposed to supporting um, a better financial system, a uh, sound monetary and financial system. And uh, that's why we kind of like Bittrex because they stick to that and that's not going away anytime soon. So Alice would like to know, what will happen to those who use the BlockFi wallet? Will the funds be released? Ooh, tough question. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, there's there's so many different moving parts and it's, it's going to take a long time to work it out. And the reason why I say that is there could be another bull market by the time um, assets, FTX assets start getting liquidated. Those assets may, might cover all of the customer losses. So it's possible that everyone gets 100% back in dollar terms, but it's also possible that they might only get um, five cents in the dollar. And uh, so, so there's a lot of different factors. Like we don't really know how deep the hole is. Uh, <laughs> There's just a hack. So um, somebody managed to steal about uh, $400 million from FTX in its final days of the collapse. So that needs to be recovered. Um, in terms of BlockFi, so it's, it's kind of like uh, an entity that um, has assets with FTX. I'm not sure how much. Really depends, you know, if they have 50% of their assets with FTX, then you can assume you're going to get 50% back and the other 50% is a big question mark. And so um, I don't know the exact numbers with, with BlockFi uh, and how much, you know, fingers crossed, it wasn't 100% FTX, but um, it's, it's going to take some time to, to really get all the numbers out. Uh, this one is more of a statement rather than a question. Front running is not illegal. No, this is from Jonathan. Ah, okay, well, I thought some jurisdictions it was illegal, or it's certainly a practice that um, yeah, people aren't, you know, people look down on. So, so, um, so, so yeah, so, so I guess, I think in the legacy markets, there are some rules for market makers where, for example, a market maker has to have um, their servers a certain distance from um, the exchanges servers. And so there's a physical distance that they have to be away from, uh, partly to try and create, I guess, a, a fair or transparent market. Um, so everyone can trade by the same rules. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly a moral hazard. And when we look at uh, on-chain in, in the crypto community, front running happens on the blockchain all the time but uh, it's transparent, we can see it, we can see the players who are doing it. Whereas when you're using a centralized entity, um, you don't really know who's doing it, or how much they're doing it, and which partners they're doing it with. And so, um, you, you, you know, there was a lot of talk around Robinhood and, and Citadel uh, front running the customers on Robinhood uh, over the last couple of years. And it's just speculation, you know, it creates, uh, more uncertainty and um, rather than uh, a transparent market where people um, know what the rules are. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a, a contentious issue and, and something that people uh, like, uh, it's something that people, love, you know, or lo love to talk about. Last one. Would you say there are blood in the streets? Oh, well, I'd say we're pretty darn close to that. You know, we, um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, the markets hit uh, some new lows. Uh, despite the, I mean, this news I thought was shocking, absolutely shocking. I thought the impact was going to be a lot bigger. So either waiting to get 
um, more news around exposure before we get new lows. Uh, but there are a lot of other things at play, like, like um, you know, the dollar index, um, that's easing. And so that's creating, um, uh, you know, some relief in the, in the crypto markets, uh, probably, uh, you know, countering the stuff that's happening with FTX. And so um, blood in the streets, we're pretty darn close, if, if not now, and potentially in the next few weeks. Um, you know, it really depends on if we have capitulation. Uh, I would have thought that that was going to happen um, sooner rather than later, but it hasn't yet. Uh, might not happen until next year, so, so we'll see. We've just had a very heartening comment from Celine. Thanks for the great webinar, and it is heartening to know that Dasset thinks that it is not just about money, but a larger goal of a better financial system for all with crypto adoption. It was great to hear, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, That's lovely. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, and, and I am happy to talk about this all day long, uh, but really I think crypto has uh, potential to be a better form of money to create um, inclusion, for billions of people where we can all play by the same rules and uh, give access to financial markets that uh, a lot of people have been excluded from. So uh, I really think it's, it's uh, doing a um, great uh, change or makeover for humanity. And so uh, this is where, you know, we wanna continue working with people who have that kind of mindset um, we're not here for, uh, you know, the money. Uh, we, we've been in crypto since for a decade now, and it's always been uh, here to make things better, make people's livelihoods better, especially those that are the most disenfranchised. You know, we have it pretty easy. Um, we're not the ones that are impacted from not having access to banking, but there are a lot of people out there that have uh, those challenges and the more we can connect with them, the more we can engage with them, the better it is for everyone. So uh, that's that's really what crypto is all about. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. And we will see you in a couple of weeks. See you. Thanks.